Tonight, you might have seen as well, we're going to have a story time at 4.15 if you'd like to join us. And Kyle's going to be here. So if you want to meet Kyle or if you want to have a story, I'm going to tell you two stories so you guys get extra time as I anxiously await the 5 p.m. live stream. So we're going to have that at 4.15. If you want to join, I'll send you something out. That's, But that's not the surprise. There's a really cool surprise that we are going to end up doing as well. Um, but anyway, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started um, so we don't get super far behind. So... Today, we're going to finish up really quickly civil rights movements, but we're mostly going to talk about Cold War stuff, and in particular, talking about the um, Cold War of the 1960s. Next class is one of a lot of students' favorite classes because we're going to talk about Vietnam. And so you can look forward to that next class because we're going to go into probably one of the most controversial events that we'll talk about in this entire class. Uh, Star Wars Project is going to be in three, and Elpitha, we will get there. That is the surprise, but don't spoil it for everybody. Um, so anyways, um, but we will talk about the Star Wars project, but that's in the 1980s. So we just have to get to the 1980s once we get there. Um, okay, so um, we got to be letting people in and out here. Um, by the way, the Zoom bombing thing I talked about last class, it's getting worse. So part of the reason that we have to have keep having new links, which is why people are taking forever to get in, uh, is because there's too many hackers that are getting in. Um, the, the surprise is not an assignment, Hudson, I promise. Actually, you, Hudson, would be the most aware of the surprise, but the surprise is coming. Um, so anyways, uh, I did want to give you guys an interesting little update, though, about the world around you, though. Uh, yes, there are hackers. Um, people, students are selling their teacher Zoom links for like 10 bucks each, and then hackers are coming in. And let's just say that what they're doing is not appropriate. Um, yeah, I've heard Miss Thackeray did get, and I heard Mr. Cater too, um, got Zoom. They're called Zoom bombing, I think is what it's called. Um, but I have heard that it's really inappropriate what they are doing, um, in there as well. So, um, by the way, uh, no, not Kate. Oh, well, I heard it was an AP Euro, and I think that that's the only one that's here. Um, by the way, speaking of TikTok, Mark says, if any of you want to send me TikToks, that he will give you his own extra credit for his own class if you send me TikToks. Um, I cannot give you extra credit, but uh, Mark wants you to send him funny TikToks because that's what we're doing on quarantine is we're watching that over and over. Memes can count too. So if you want to send memes, I will allow that too. Okay. Um, anyways, so let's go ahead and let's get started. Um, so we're going to be talking about, uh, yeah, I'll, just send me anything you want. Anything you want to send me, as long as it's school appropriate. Mark says that they have to be funny. That's his rule. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to start with, um, oh, really quick. I wanted to show you these two interesting things. Um, here's your relation to a push in the world today. Um, so this was actually a couple of days ago. Um, these people in New York were running like 20 speakeasies. Um, where you could go and gamble and drink during the coronavirus, and they all got shot down and charged with like 20 felonies. So there's your modern day connection to the 1920s. Apparently speakeasies are still around. And then another one, this is actually one that just happened today, um, is that uh, the governor of California said that this is a good time to completely redo um, the uh, laws in California. So he said he's opening up a brand new progressive era um, to be able to change the systems in New York to uh, improve them. Thank you all for sending me memes, by the way. I will look at them all later. Uh, hopefully no mafia. We talked about mafia. Mafia is bad. We, we had a whole discussion about that, remember? That was a good time. Uh, so we're going to really quickly um, finish uh, everything that's going on in terms of civil rights movement. So here are a couple of little things that um, we'll want to talk about with that. So we're going to start with feminism. So feminism rises in the 1960s, um, and it starts with this book called The Feminine Mystique. And basically, the idea was, was that women were being put into comfortable concentration camps, which is basically the 1950s housewife mentality. So because all these women were being put into these, quote, concentration camps, women needed to break out of this. And it basically encouraged women to break the cult of domesticity and no longer be confined to it. So Betty Friedan is really the start of feminism. So if you're a really big feminist, this is a um, really good person that you would want to research later on uh, to be able to learn more a little bit about. 
But really what she wanted to do, so you can see right here, it says the feminine mystique has succeeded in burying millions of American women alive. We want to be able to break out of that. And I believe this book was written in 1960, if I remember correctly. Um, it was actually banned. So if you've ever heard of the banned books list, so for example, Harry Potter is banned because of its witchcraft. Um, the feminine mystique is banned. It's actually not allowed in the vast majority of libraries because it is too uh is too controversial of women's rights. And a lot of libraries, especially in the Deep South today, won't even have this book because it was so controversial at the time. Uh, so that leads us to Roe v. Wade, which Roe v. Wade is one I would star. It's a really good one. Um, that's If you've ever taken uh, AP Gov too, it's considered one of the five most influential Supreme Court cases in American history. Um, and so the Roe v. Wade is all about abortion. So let me explain what happens. So you have this girl and her name is called Jane Roe. And for the record, her name was not Jane Roe. Jane Roe is a pseudonym for basically um, an anonymous person. So she was in Texas and she had four kids. And so she wanted to have an abortion when she found out she was pregnant. Well, she showed up at multiple different abortion clinics and they had all been shut down because at the time abortion was against the law in Texas. So she um, ends up suing to have an abortion. Now she ends up having the kid and uh, giving it up because Supreme Court cases take years and years and years. Um, but this is actually her in real life. Uh, they did not know it was her at the time, though. She did not reveal herself for about 15 years afterwards. Um, but it all was about abortion. Now, Roe v. Wade basically uh, bans you from having, or I shouldn't say bans you from having bans. Uh, so you uh, cannot ban abortion with Roe v. Wade. So what it says is that states can limit abortion, which we'll talk about in just a second, but they cannot all out ban abortion, which I'll also talk about in just a second. So basically this comes out with the idea of what is the correct thing? Is it, um, would you rather be pro-life or pro-choice? And that kind of begins and it's still, it obviously is really both present in today's world as well. So a lot of people started to have both sides. Should it be a woman's right to be able to choose what happens to her body? Or is that fetus considered a baby? Um, now, in some states, it really depends on the situation. So in terms of abortion rights, you won't get in trouble for having an abortion in those states. But for example, in states like Colorado, if you kill somebody who is pregnant, you can be charged with manslaughter for the child as well that has been unborn. However, that does not apply to, for example, if you're having an abortion or a miscarriage or something like that. Um, interesting fact, though, about all of this. So she was the person who advocated for pro-choice. She actually switched her opinion in the 1980s. So the 1980s is when she revealed that she was Jane Roe in Roe v. Wade, and it actually ended up resulting in her becoming a pro-life advocate um, in the 1980s. And by the way, as we go through a couple of this controversial stuff, let's make sure in the chat that we don't like, uh, we haven't said anything, I'm just warning you. Be very careful about what you say, because this is obviously a very controversial topic. Um, but she did change to pro-life in the 1980s. So what does this mean today? So obviously, Roe v. Wade is one of the most controversial Supreme Court cases ever happening. In Texas, a couple of years ago, there was a congressman that introduced a law um, in order to be able to say that if a woman has an abortion, she could receive the death penalty because it was equivalent to first degree murder. Um, and so this obviously didn't get very far. It also said if you're um, a doctor and you perform an abortion, you also can be executed as well. Um, this is actually not something that has continued up until today. So what are some things that um, do get limited. So this one doesn't make it past the committee work, but for example, what is some really restrictive ones today? So the most restrictive one is what is called, oops, uh, what's called a heartbeat law. So a heartbeat law basically bans all abortion um, if uh, you can hear a fetal heartbeat. So when a woman gets pregnant, the average woman finds out that they're pregnant at six weeks old. At six weeks old is also, or six weeks um, of gestation uh, is when she finds out she's pregnant. Uh, that's also about the time when you can first hear a fatal heartbeat. So does it ban abortion? No. Does it basically ban abortion? Yes. Um, and here's all the legislation where there's heartbeat. So everything that you can see that is all in the color right here are all different states that have had some sort of a heartbeat law. Um, some states, it's a little bit more strict compared to others. Obviously, in some cases, abortion, though, is um, a lot more open. So, for example, um, there are ones that say um, you can also have an abortion in financial need or something like that. But especially these states that are in the really deep blue, um, all of these are states that do currently have an, a heartbeat law that is um, on the books. Here in Utah, we actually had a controversial one happen last year. We placed a new abortion ban that says that you cannot have an abortion after 18 weeks. That's up from the 21 weeks that it had been previously. 
Um, that was originally blocked, but it has been now allowed, and now that's our restriction here in Utah. We actually had something that um, I'm not sure if you guys know a lot about. I know a lot of us are really stressed about the current situation with the pandemic and things like that. So you might have missed this little slip in right here. Two weeks ago, Governor Herbert actually and the Congress here, or the state Congress, uh, actually ended up passing a new abortion ban that does ban all abortions. Now, here's the asterisk to it, though. All abortions are banned except for in needs of um, women who have like a health concern or like it's uh, it endangers a woman's life or something like that. Um, but this only goes into effect if they overturn Roe v. Wade. So if Roe v. Wade is overturned in the U.S. Supreme Court, this law automatically goes in, which would ban all abortions here in the state of Utah. Um, we do have some other abortion bans, which is another way to be able to kind of discourage people. So, for example, they passed a law last year that said that before you could have an abortion, um, you would have uh, the doctor is supposed to show you an ultrasound. So that's another one that was just barely signed into law that before you have an abortion, they have to show you an ultrasound and the heartbeat of your baby. Um, they also passed a brand new law. This was signed yesterday into law that says that um, all fetal remains from abortions or also miscarriages have to be buried or cremated and given a proper burial. Um, so there's all different ways here in Utah, though, there are certain ones that are more common. So for example, we do have an abortion ban here in Utah that if the sole reason you're having an abortion is because your child has Down syndrome, that is against the law here in Utah. Um, so we do have some abortion laws and things like that. But again, unless Roe v. Wade is overturned, um, I will tell you the newest Supreme Court justice that was added in did say that he would be willing to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, we are in a more conservative um, Supreme Court. I personally don't, I think it would take a lot to have Roe v. Wade overturned, but who knows. But anyways, so one of the most controversial ones that happened here. Um, all around. So heading into other um, major civil rights movements. So this is going to be the Latino civil rights movements. So Cesar Chavez, who we actually have a street in West Valley named after, it's called Cesar Chavez uh, Boulevard or Drive. Um, he decides that he's going to help migrant workers. So the Bracero program, which we talked about previously, brings a whole bunch of Latino migrant workers into the United States. And he wants to advocate for better work conditions. And so what happens is, is that Cesar Chavez begins um, trying to for people the problems going on. So, for example, one way that they wanted to get rid of the germs that the Latinos were bringing in um, were also on the fields is that they would spray them all with pesticide from head to toe. This is actually happening right now in the Middle East to get rid of coronavirus. Um, another thing, too, is that a lot of these people had free um, they had uh, free food and board, but the food was like maybe bread and soup once a day. Um, and living on the floor. Uh, in terms of what's bad for your health, um, yes, it's bad for your health. Um, what I would say in terms of the pesticides and things like that, this is actually really common throughout the world. Um, and in particular, I saw it especially in Iran and Pakistan who are doing this in particular. So if you enter a school, you have to be sprayed down um, to enter. Um, I think a lot of it is which would you rather have? Would you rather be sprayed with pesticides or would you rather... Um, possibly get coronavirus or anything like that. Um, I knew, so for example, we, this happened at Skyline a couple years ago when they were spraying everything down with that, um, that, what is it called? Disinfectant or whatever. Um, there were people who like were spraying themselves, um, which is why students weren't allowed to do that anymore because they were spraying themselves with the, uh, the disinfectant spray. Um, and what they had said is, oh, well, I don't want to get sick. So I would definitely say it's a health risk, but again, what are you willing to do? So for example, are you willing to take a more controversial drug or controversial treatment in order to stop coronavirus or in this case, um, the diseases or whatever it could be. Uh, but anyway, so he starts to advocate for things. So he starts by doing, for example, strikes. So he encouraged everybody to stop eating grapes, which was the major thing in uh, California that a lot of the Latinos were uh, picking. So he encouraged everybody to stop eating grapes and it worked. Um, in fact, grape consumption in the United States dropped by almost 90%, um, which led to people changing it. Uh, in terms of raisins, I've never been asked that question, um, so I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but what I can tell you is, is that this was also encouraging businesses to not purchase grapes um, to be able to do it. Hi, Hudson. Good to see you, too. 
Uh, the American Indian Movement was a, uh, one that attempted to help bring awareness of the problem of Native American reservations, especially with poverty, school conditions, unemployment. So what they did is they did what's called the Occupy Movement, which is where they literally occupied a place, like a sit-in, um, to be able to show what was going on. And one of their most famous places was at Alcatraz. This was back when Alcatraz was decommissioned. There was no guards. So they took boats across to Alcatraz, and they lived at Alcatraz for nine months. And while they were there, they were just trying to bring awareness, saying, we're here to show the issues going on with Native Americans. When you go there today, this left-hand picture, you can actually still see that today. Um, this is what it looks like. So whenever you go to Alcatraz next time, look for this Welcome Indians. Everyone always says, I don't understand it. It's because that was the Occupy um, Alcatraz movement by the American Indian movement. And then the Stonewall Rights is the last one that we'll talk about, which is LGBTQ. So really, what a lot of people don't know about LGBTQ is we have so much discrimination now and things like that against people in the LGBTQ plus world. However, it was about a million times worse before this. A lot of people aren't aware that, for example, homosexuality was like a first, second degree felony equivalent compared to today. Um, you could be castrated if you were found to be homosexual, if you were a male. Um, they could do forced sterilization on you because they did not want the gay thing to continue out through um, the hereditary things. Uh, they did awful, 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 terrible things um, to people who are LGBTQ, which is why I, I remember I had a student a couple years ago that said, but Miss Ray, I've never heard of anybody who was lesbian or gay before 1950. Yeah, there's a reason why. It's because they killed everybody. And they got rid of people and they jailed people. And there's a reason why it was so hidden is because it was seen as this horrible, terrible thing in a lot of areas to be LGBTQ. Well, this begins to change in the Stonewall riots. And what happens with Stonewall is that the Stonewall uh, riots was in Greenwich in New York City. And it was where all the LGBTQ members of America went. It was this congregation. In fact, but right before the Stonewall riots, Greenwich Village was 96%. Um, LGBTQ. Uh, the years of Greenwich Village, I believe it starts 1930s-ish, but it really improves 1950s to 1960s. And so what happens is, is that you have this, it's, it's kind of one of those things that is illegal. So in New York City, it was illegal to be LGBTQ, um, in particular committing any sort of homosexual act. But instead, you had this Greenwich Village, which was all these people living there completely open to their sexuality, and everyone just kind of accepted it, and they moved on. Well, unfortunately, that comes to a head in what's known as the Stonewall Riot. So what happens is there's all these gay nightclubs. Um, in particular, the Black Cat is the one that begins the Stonewall Riots. And there was a law that did say if you were homosexual, you could be arrested. And there was also a law in New York that said if you were homosexual, you were not allowed to drink alcohol. Because apparently, that increases something? I'm not 100% sure. Uh, Q stands for queer. If you're talking about LGBTQ, I'm not 100% sure. If, I think that's what you're referring to. So anyways, what happens is, is that you have, um, this, uh, black cat place in this, in Greenwich village and the police show up one night and they completely arrest everybody. They arrest 95% of people in this. And it becomes this massive riot that night of arresting people who are LGBTQ. And basically what happens is this becomes the start of the LGBTQ movement in America. Before this, it was not okay to be gay and it was not okay to be openly gay, but all of a sudden now people are being beaten because of it. You have photography, video. So all of a sudden it begins the massive LGBTQ movement. So what they did is, and this was next to the Stonewall Inn, which is across the street from the Black Cat, is people met at the Stonewall Inn and they said, we wanted to write, we want to be able to show what's going on. So what they did, and this was in June of, I think it was, early 1960s or 70s. And basically what happens is, is that they start to have gay pride marches. And so what they did is they marched down the streets open, even though they were breaking so many laws just by being gay, they didn't care about it. And what happened is that this caused a reduction of in New York City and New York State, the reduction of anti-LGBTQ laws. Um, it began to be lessened over time. A really big accomplishment is in 1972. A lot of people aren't aware of this. Somebody mentioned it in the chat, though. Uh, the American Psychological Association did say that being gay was considered a mental illness. Uh, you could actually be forced institutionalized for being gay because you were mentally unstable, according to the American Psychology Society. They reworded the requirements, and they now said it was not considered a psychological mental illness uh, to be gay. As we've moved on, obviously, we are not where we should be in terms of LGBTQ, but we have had a lot of success and improvements. 
Um, as time has gone on, Stonewall has become this iconic place. Greenwich Village is still very much an LGBTQ area where a lot of people go um, to be able to celebrate that part of their sexuality. And today, every June, we still have gay pride movements and gay pride parades. Uh, and it's the exact same time as when Stonewall riots were back in the 1960s. Um, obviously, though, there's still a lot of controversy, especially, yeah, it is postponed this year, unfortunately, because of coronavirus. Um, but here in Utah, we still have a whole bunch of controversy. I know people every year when we have the gay pride parades, people put their banners up um, of anti-LGBTQ stuff. Um, I know, of, for example, people who um, have put in other cities, they'll put tax on the streets so that when people are walking, they'll step on the tax. Um, all these awful, terrible things that have happened. Um, so obviously, we're still trying to be able to improve our LGBTQ stuff with the really famous gay marriage law a couple of years ago. That was a really big step forward, um, but still stuff to have done. I do know in the Obama era, they have been trying to um, add to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that we talked about last class. They are trying to add LGBTQ um, uh, into that of sexual orientation. Um, but obviously we have had improvements such as transgender laws in schools where we have to now allow um, to have bathrooms that are gender neutral. There was actually a school in Oregon that 100% of their bathrooms are gender neutral. Um, that was a really cool format that they ended up doing. Um, our most recent administration has drawn back a whole bunch of stuff uh, that has pulled back a lot of the safeguards for LGBTQ students. But um, anyways, anybody have any questions about rights of LGBTQ or anything like that? Okay, I love your little, uh, Thing in here yeah skyline well i'll tell you this skyline is not the best school for having gender neutral things but what i can tell you is the new school has far more gender neutral bathrooms and things like that to allow people to go in um according to the rules though if you are transgender you can uh go into the bathroom if you're pleasing but i do know a lot of students feel a lot more comfortable in a gender neutral bathroom i did hear that the new school is supposed to have i think it's four on every floor that is a gender neutral bathroom but i'm not 100 percent sure if that is going to continue but this one in oregon there was actually lawsuits about that one in oregon but they said we don't care we've already built it and it's going to be the way it is um, so they actually got out of that lawsuit because the school was already built and they said they couldn't adjust the format to be able to make it non-gender neutral. So interesting fact. Um, but we will see what happens with the new school because I don't even know what's going to happen. They've stopped all the construction and different things like that. So we will end up seeing. I'm not sure 100%. Don't quote me on the bathroom thing, but I did hear that they're supposed to have way more. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, Skyline did remove bathroom doors because too many, the boys started it with punching out all the mirrors and there was too much vaping and other inappropriate things happening in the bathroom. So that's actually a district-wide thing, by the way. Just let you know. It's district-wide that we can't have any bathrooms at the high school. You'll see the new skyline. Don't worry. Oh, I did I did hear a rumor that there were students vaping on the Zoom meetings and some of the other classes. Don't do that either. Bad students. Be good students. Okay. Uh, anyways, so now let's get into the uh, the Cold War. And we're almost to our... Surprise. So we're getting there. Uh, so really quick. So Eisenhower, who we've talked about, um, will there still be bathroom stalls and walls between toilets? Yes. So um, what and maybe I could pull it up and show it to you guys sometime. Uh, but basically how it is, is that the bathroom. So like the bathrooms are open. So when you go in, you can see the sinks right there and it's open into the hallway. And then all the bathroom stalls the uh, doors actually go from half an inch above the floor to half an inch above the ceiling. So there's still complete privacy and things like that for everybody that's at the school. So hopefully I explained that. I, I, I can maybe find it and send it out to you guys so you could see what that one school did with their bathrooms. The only reason I know about it is because I have a friend that's a uh, news anchor in Oregon and she covered that um, bathroom issue. I'll see if I can find it. Um, so anyway, so heading into the Cold War. So Eisenhower, who we talked about before, comes up with this idea of the Eisenhower Doctrine, which basically says um, any country around the world can request military forces if they're attempting to stop armed aggression from the, another country, in particular from communism. So, for example, in the 19, for example, in the 1960s, uh, there were several Middle Eastern countries that asked for just that. Can we have assistance from the United States to stop communism or stop Russia from being able to come in? And so basically this starts this period 
of, again, increased Cold War concerns. So in the 1950s, we also created what's called the Massive Retaliation Policy. This is one that I would start because it's basically what directly causes a really, really bad incident coming up in just a second. So this was our defense policy that said if anybody pushes us, we will push them back with nuclear weapons. So basically, it's the idea of if you push me, I'm going to push back, but I'm going to drop a couple of hydrogen bombs on you. And this was in the 1950s when really it begins to rise of this concern of um, you're going to bomb me, I'm going to bomb you right back. Very similar to uh, Douglas MacArthur, who wanted to drop all those nuclear bombs uh, on Did China. <laughs> yes. No. Okay. Uh, so this also is the idea of mutually assured destruction. So this is the idea that if one of uh, if either us or the USSR uh, is hit with a nuclear weapon, we will immediately respond with the exact same. So you can see what the concern is, right? We're having bombs, they're having bombs, and it's going to get even worse when we're eventually going to drop atomic bombs on each other and basically kill everybody. Where is this on the notes? Um, maybe I missed it. So just just type it in there. I guess I might have missed it. I'm not sure. I had to redo all my notes because this is normally a three day lecture that I'm putting into 80 minutes. So uh, I would just type it in there. It is in there. Okay. Elpitha can maybe show everybody where it's at. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but basically, this is the idea right here. So you can see, will you go back to the last slide so we can type it? There you go. That one. I'm hearing it's on there. Maybe control F. Maybe. Okay, we're good now? Okay, cool. Uh, so you can see, so on no account to be used because the enemy might retaliate, on no account to be used because the enemy might retaliate. So we have all these bombs, we're not dropping them on each other, but what we are doing is we're 100% prepared for war. It's very similar to today. Um, the statistic of how many warheads that we have in our nuclear warheads is all over the place. I've seen numbers that say we only have 10. I've seen numbers that say we have 10,000. Um, we have them all around the world in case anybody needs to bomb each other. Uh, we always have those ready, which we will talk about, actually, an interesting fact about that coming up in just a second. Now, in the late 1960s, Stalin dies, and Khrushchev is going to become the new president, or the new leader, I should say, of the USSR. I do believe he was considered a president, according to Russia, but I'm not 100% sure. So he comes into the United States, and he says, I'm going to denounce everything Stalin did, and we are now going to be an era of compromise. So we're now gonna compromise, we're gonna be best friends, and we're gonna be great with uh, the USSR. Interesting fact though, when he came, um, he went to 15 different cities around the United States and each one gave him a different turkey and he collected all these turkeys and brought them home and then had a giant feast of eating all the American turkeys. Uh, so kind of trying to be able to have this like, it was like a peace sign, but with turkeys, cause you know, we're America. Uh, but then at the same time, obviously, that this wasn't really well accepted by a lot of people. Um, Miles does say that the official position title was general secretary. Now I know. Uh, but anyway, so Khrushchev does come and say we're all going to be best friends. And does everybody think that that's actually going to happen? Because uh, the answer is no. It's not going to happen. Uh, Eisenhower doctrine related to Truman doctrine? Yes, very similar. They're both very, very, very similar. Um, just by different presidents that is going on. So basically what happens is... At the same time, Eisenhower begins to doubt it. As soon as Khrushchev le leaves, he's like, you know what, guys, we do need to calm down. And the fear was this military industrial complex. And this was a term coined by Eisenhower. We basically said, if we spend so much money on defense, we aren't going to have enough money for everything else. So I hear a lot of times you guys say, well, why do we spend 67% of our federal budget on military? You would support the military industrial complex that says that we are spending too much money and we will have shortfalls. So we actually begin to massively reduce our um, our military spending in the late 1960s. However, that doesn't last very long because all of a sudden we start to have some conflicts. So it starts with what's called the U-2 crisis. So basically what happens is we have these things called U-2 planes. They were secret spy planes that went all the way up above the atmosphere. So it was basically in the layer between the atmosphere and space. And what happened is, is that it was so high that we thought there's no way anybody's gonna be able to see us. Well, unfortunately, as we were taking secret uh, photographs of Russia, stratosphere, yes, that's correct, um, basically what happens is they shoot it down. And they're going to take Francis Gary Powers, who was the pilot, and they take him back to Russia as a, um, as a prisoner of war. And then they exchange um, the uh, pilot, Francis Gary Powers, with another uh, 
spy that had been taken by the United States. They meet at Checkpoint Charlie in Berlin and they exchange them. This was a movie a few years ago. Anybody know what the movie was called? Do they have any guesses? Did they watch this movie? It, it, uh, it, I, I know. I Hold on, hold on. It, it's not Spies in Disguise, but that's really close. Contra Libre. It's not Frozen 3. Okay. Bridge of Spies. It's Bridge of Spies. It's not Checkpoint. Checkpoint Charlie is the location where they exchange them out. So it is called Bridge of Spies. So if you want to see a really good movie, um, Bridge of Spies with Tom Hanks, he won a bunch of awards for it. It's all about the prisoner exchange of exchanging between these two. But obviously now all of a sudden we have concern. We're all spying on each other of what's going on. Now at the same time, this is also when uh, JFK becomes the president. So JFK assumes the president with his uh, famous wife, Jackie Kennedy, um, also known as Jackie O. She was definitely the style icon. And they were considered this adorable American family. They had these cute little dogs. They had all these kids in the presidency. They were the perfect spouse and husband. They were America's power couple, or maybe they actually weren't. Uh, you see, these two were uh, a, a marriage that was um, arranged beforehand. It was very much a political marriage between the two. And basically what happened is that it, it seemed like they were these perfect couple, but in fact, uh, they weren't so much. Allegedly, um, this was a photo that was taken after one of his meetings, which is with Marilyn Monroe. That's probably the most famous of alleged affair that he had. Remember, FDR probably had around 40 to 50 affairs. So um, regardless, though, nobody knew about this allegedly because it was the perfect power couple. And this really came out more um, after JFK ends up getting assassinated. Uh, now, what happens, though, is we have two major events during the 19. Um, 60s in terms of the Cold War, and it starts with the Bay of Pigs, which is your guys' um, little cartoon that you guys can draw, your little connect the dots. Uh, so what happens with the Bay of Pigs is basically, um, in Cuba, there were all these anti-Castro rebels that wanted to overthrow communism in Cuba. Well, at the time, Fidel Castro is going to be the leader of Cuba, and basically what happens is that... Um, JFK wants to get rid of them, but they don't want anybody to know about it. So America secretly funds all of these rebels in Cuba and attempts to be able to get them to win. They also sent around, I think it was 3,000 U.S. Army men to overthrow Fidel Castro. But he said, this was 100% not us. We absolutely swear. Well, what ends up happening is they fail absolutely miserably in what's called the Bay of Pigs invasion. The Bay of Pigs invasion, this is called the Bay of Pigs right here. They invaded, they try to get into Havana, Cuba, and they are pushed back. The actual invasion lasts less than three hours. America and the rebels lose. All the rebels were arrested. Several of the um, American soldiers were captured, several of them injured. So obviously now JFK has been found out. So he welcomes them back as heroes. They actually, during the, um, I think this was during the last game of the World Series for baseball, they invited all of them back as these massive heroes. But it was a total failure on JFK's part of this brigade that went and tried to stop communism, but they totally failed. Uh, which, by the way, is really interesting for Cuban-American relations. So basically, as soon as this happens, we close off Cuba from the United States. However, what happens is, is that this is not a 100% stop. So if you ever heard of the famous Cuban cigars, that's where this comes from. And yes, it is in We Didn't Start the Fire, which is interesting because we'll talk about that song a little bit later in the 1980s. Um, but basically what happens is that you have these cigars that were this symbol of the blockage between Cuba and the United States. And allegedly, JFK had the largest Cuban cigar. So what he did is the day before the block the blockade started with stopping trade between Cuba. He allegedly bought over 20,000 Cuban cigars and then in his White House had a secret room, all of the Cuban cigars. So he blocks trade, but has secret Cuban cigars all throughout the White House. So this actually massively impacts things today. So who is this? Who is this person? People. Is that OJ Simpson? That is not OJ Simpson. Wait, which person? Kay. The guy in the back or the front? <laughs> not this guy. Okay, Jay-Z, good. And what about this lady? Beyonce? Beyonce. Good. You guys are funny. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so this is Jay-Z and Beyonce, and they are his wife. Yes, they are married, but it is Beyonce. Um, so basically, they went to Cuba a couple years ago, even though we had a travel ban and things like that. They posted all these pictures on Instagram, and everybody was freaking out because they were like, how the heck did these guys, did they sneak in? What did they do? They actually got a... Um, 
a travel allowance that said it was sanctioned because allegedly it was a humanitarian thing, but they went on vacation to Cuba. This was back in 2013. Around that time, we also, or 2015, excuse me, we also had several different other things that were really weird that happened too. So for example, um, the American soccer team, so the U.S. men's national team, they had a game in Cuba against the Cuban national team. However, because of the sanctions, they played the entire game with not a single fan. So they did that entire thing because they could not have it because it was against the law. And they were flown in. They landed. They started the game 30 minutes after they landed. And as soon as they were over, they immediately got on the plane. They never exchanged handshakes or anything like that because it was against the law. Now, a couple years ago, Miss Ray and Marky Mark, they went on a cruise together. And when we were on that cruise, this was in um, December of 2015 or 2014, what basically happened is, is that while we were on that cruise, we passed by Cuba. And while we were passing by Cuba, we were all like, oh my gosh, this is like this crazy place that nobody can go to. And literally while we were on the cruise, this is that December 17th one, they opened up Cuba to the United States. That was Obama's thing. Um, I do really like that you say that Marky Mark is your inspiration. I will tell them that after he finishes his video game. Uh, but anyways, what happened is they opened the door to Cuba so all these people could go. And it started the very first um, travel sites of people being able to arrive in Cuba. However, this is not continued up until today. The most recent administration has reversed this. And we now have a travel ban again on Cuba. Um, but it did open up for about six years before um, President Trump did close it again to Cuba. Uh, because of communism. Uh, Raul Castro did take over after Fidel Castro died. However, all the Castros are now dead. And so it is this really weird lingering thing in Cuba of what should happen. Uh, so the Berlin Wall also goes up during this time. This is in 1961. It literally goes up basically overnight into this massive wall, uh, blocking this as well. Why do all communist leaders have fa epic facial hair? Not 100% sure, but I do know part of it is um, it's a power thing. So a lot of ones had that as well um, in terms of power struggle and stuff like that. Uh, brinkmanship was basically, again, this idea that we would uh, go to war where we're constantly going to be at the exact edge of war, encouraging somebody else to back down. So do you guys remember we talked about Iran earlier this year and how we were ready to go and we were ready to go to war as soon as the Iran bombings and stuff like that happened? Well, that's what happens in the 1960s. So you have Khrushchev over here, you have JFK over here and their H-bombs. They're both 100% ready to go to war at any possible time. Well, that incident did happen in what's called the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is a star term. And it, please ask your grandparents, if you get a chance, what they remember about the Cuban Missile Crisis, because it was one of the scariest times in American history. So here's basically what happens. We're living our lives in October of 1962. Like it was no big deal whatsoever. It's very similar to us like two weeks ago when everything was just fine and we were all hanging out and going to parks and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, everything crumbles literally overnight. So what happens is we're hanging out in October of 1962, when all of a sudden, one of our spy planes over Cuba takes these pictures. And what they discovered is there were several places that had potential missile sites. And we're like, wait a second, Cuba's not supposed to have any missile sites. Well, then as they go to look further and further and further, they discover that uh, the in Cuba, they have about 150 nuclear bombs in ready position, in their launch positions, ready to go with the press of a button. And all of a sudden people realize we all just might die. And all of a sudden Cuba, which is not Russia, is very, very close to us, could possibly kill us all with nuclear weapons. So people start to have massive fears and they find all of these missile sites all throughout Cuba, basically overnight. And it begins this massive 13 day standoff. Now, Part of the fear is how quickly these nuclear bombs can get to places. So if Cuba wanted to bomb Miami, Florida, the bomb would get there in approximately 15 seconds. If they wanted to bomb us over here in Salt Lake City, which is right about here, it would take them about five and a half minutes to get that nuclear bomb to where we're at. That's not enough time to be able to get underground. So everybody basically felt like they were all of a sudden going to die within seconds. Well, what happened is is that people begin to fear things. So originally JFK basically blockades into Cuba. They say um, Russia, who was communist allies with Cuba, don't do anything, let's just go ahead and calm down and we won't all die. Well, Cuba decides that they're gonna send about 20 um, destroyers as well as 20 aircraft carriers into Cuba. And it basically put us on the absolute brink of war. So for 13 days, everybody thought we were all going to die. Um, School was canceled, everybody went home, nobody went to work. 
everybody sat in their houses waiting to go into their nuclear bombs to all die. And it was this massive fear of people feeling like we were all going to die and it was going to be from these massive nuclear bombs that were going off. Well, what happens in the end is actually very odd. Um, out of the blue, Khrushchev, so they, the Russian ships are on the border of the blockade. They're sitting there for two days staring at each other. Out of the blue, Khrushchev says, we're going to leave. And they move and they destroy all of the Cuban missile sites that they had created. Um, so you had this massive brink and this very quick dissipation of um, calming between the two countries. And we were honestly completely on the brink of war um, where we all felt like we were going to die. Uh, you are correct. We had to take our nukes out of Turkey, which we did. Um, again, what I should say is we did, but we kept them in the countries right next to Turkey. So, um, but we did start to take a little bit out, but it basically um, calms everything down, which is why we have our surprise for today. So I'm going to tell you guys a story today. And it's one of my favorite stories. And unfortunately, if you are 2A, you already have a small precursor because a couple weeks ago, I walked in to Hudson reading this story and um, there was a little bit of a spoiler. So sorry for 2A that you have a little bit of a spoiler, but we are going to read a story today. We're going to read a children's book. So hopefully you guys are all in like your jammies or your story time clothes or whatever it's going to be that you can be able to learn this. And we're all going to be able to learn this wonderful story. Now as a kid, oh yeah, please don't staple your ear again. I forgot that that happened, but thanks for reminding me. Um, that he stapled his ear in class. Thank you so much for reminding me of that incident. Uh, so anyways, so here, yes, he did staple his ear. Uh, so here's what we are going to learn about. Now, as a kid, you probably read all these cute little Dr. Seuss books and thought they were absolutely adorable. What a lot of people don't have any idea is that Dr. Seuss, 90% of his books were all propaganda books. So if you have ever read, for example, The Sneetches, The Sneetches is all about the Holocaust. If you've ever read The Lorax, that's all about environmentality in the 1960s and 70s. Um, so all of these are propaganda books to teach you things. Um, and yes, the answer is yes, he did staple himself with a stapler. Um, yes, he definitely did that. Uh, so we are going to read a Dr. Seuss book, and it's Seuss book, excuse me. And I want to see if you guys have ever um, read this book before. Oh. So this book is called The Butter Battle Book. Unmute yourself or type it in the comments if you've ever read this book before or heard of this book. No. Okay, so I have. Yes, it's beautiful. As a kid, like, it looks like, like this. Butter, butter side up. Yes, we will butter we'll we'll up. go through it. Maybe a couple kids. Well, if your parents made you read this as a kid, your parents made you read propaganda, political propaganda. So you can go and let them know that you were forced to engage in political propaganda as a small child. Because this entire book is propaganda. So what we're going to do is we're going to read this book and I want you to think what are some of the things that he is trying to portray in this book about the Cold War um, and really about the stress that's going on with it. So we're going to read this little children's book so you can go ahead and get all snuggly because we're going to have story time and we are going to read this book which Hudson did a great job reading it two weeks ago without my permission but 2A did read I think the very first like quarter of it so you guys know it, but you didn't know the lessons behind it. So that's all what is the important part here. Okay, so this is called The Butter Battle Book. And again, you're thinking here, what is this story trying to say? And I am going to ask you what it meant. So please make sure that you are listening. Okay, so Butter Battle Book, here we go. And there's a lot of like really hard words. So I apologize if I uh, stumble myself. Okay, on the last day of summer, 10 hours before fall, Maybe. My grandfather took me out to the wall. I wonder if I can, let me try to adjust this really quickly. I wonder if I can do this. Yay, I'm gonna do that. Okay. For a while he stood silent, then he silently, okay, this is a lot harder than I thought it might be when uh, I thought of doing this. Okay, let's try this again. For a while he stood silent, then he finally said with a very sad shake of his very old head, as you know, on this side of the wall, we are ukes. On the other, far other side of this wall of the Zooks. Then my grandfather said, it's high time that you knew of the terrible, horrible thing that Zooks do. In every Zook house and in every Zook town, every Zook eats his bread with the butter side down. Do, do, do. Okay. 
But we yukes, as you know, when we breakfast or sup, spread our better, Grandpa said, with the butter side up. That's the right, honest way Grandpa gritted his teeth so you don't trust a zook who spreads bread underneath. Every zook must be washed. He has kinks in his soul. That's why, as a youth, I made watching my goal, watching zooks for the zook, watching Border Patrol. Come on. In those days, of course, the wall wasn't so high, and I could look any zook square in the eye. If he dared to come close, I could give him a twitch with my tough, tufted, prickly snickberry switch. For a while, that worked fine. All the yukes, zooks stayed away, and our country was safe. Then one terrible day, a very rude zook by the name of Van Itch snuck up and slingshotted my snickberry switch. With my broken off switch, with my head hung in shame to the chief yukaro, in great sorrow I came, but our leader just smiled. He said, you're not to blame, and those zooks will be sorry they started this game. We'll dress you up right up in a fancier suit. We'll give you a fancier slingshot to shoot. And he ordered the boys in the back room to figure how to build some sort of triple sling jigger. With my triple sling jigger, I sure felt much bigger. I marched to the wall with great vim and great vigor. Right up to Van Itch with my head on, hand on the trigger. I'll have no more nonsense, I said with a frown from Zooks who we bred with the butter side down. Van Itch looked very, quite sickly. He ran off quite quickly. I'm, I'm happy to say he came back the next day in a spiffy new suit with a brand, big new machine. And he snarled as he said, looking frightfully mean, you may fling those hard rocks with your triple sling jigger, but I also now have my hand on a trigger. My wonderful weapon, the Jiggers Rock Snatch him, we'll fling him right back just as quick as we catch him. We'll have no more nonsense. We'll take no more gut from you yukes who eat bread with the butter side up. Uh, I have failed, sir, I sobbed as I made my report to the Chief Yukaroo in the headquarters fort. He laughed. You've done nothing at all of the sort. Our slingshots have failed. That's old-fashioned stuff. Slingshots, my dear boy, are not modern enough. All we need is some newfangled kind of a gun. My boys in the back room have already begun. To think of a walloping whizzing or one, my bright boys are thinking they're on the right track. They'll think of one quick. We'll send you right back. They thought up a great one. They certainly did. They thought up a gun called the Kickaboo Kid, which had loads of, uh, which was loaded with powerful puadu powder and ants eggs and bees leg and dried fried clam chowder. And they carefully trained a real smart dog named Daniel to serve as our country's first gun-toting spaniel. Then Daniel, the Kickapoo Spaniel, and I marched back up toward the wall with our heads held up high. While everyone cheered for their cheers for the sky, fight, fight for the butter side up, do or die. Well, we didn't do and we didn't quite die, but we sure did get worse than poor Daniel and I. Ben Itch was there too, and he said the old pig, the boys in my back room, invented this rig called the Eight Nozzled Elephant Toted Boom Blitz. It shoots high explosive sour cherry stone pits. And we'll put your dumb kickapoo kid on the fritz. Poor Daniel and I were scared out of our wits. Once more by Ben Itch, I was bested and beat once again i limped home with the wall and defeat i dragged and sad and my spirits were low as i thought that they would ever go when i heard a boom ba and a diddly dill uh and our butter up band marched over the hill the chief yukaroo had sent them to meet me along with the right set up song girls to greet me they sang oh be faithful believe in thy butter and they lifted my spirits right out of the gutter my boy smiled the chief yukaroo we've just voted we've made you a general you've been promoted your pretty new uniform's ready, get in it. The big war is coming. You're going to begin it. And what's more, this time, you are certain to win it. My boys in the back room have finally found how. Just wait till you see what they've puttered up now. In their great new machine, you'll fly over that wall and clobber those buttered down zooks once and all. Those boys in the back room, they sure knew how to putter. They made me a thing called the utterly sputter. And I jumped aboard with my heart all a flutter and steered toward the land of the upside down butter. The machine was so modern, so frightfully new, no one just knew exactly just what it could do. But it had several faucets that sprinkled blue goo, which somehow would sprinkle the zooks as I flew and gum up that butter side down that they chew. I was racing pell-mell when I heard a voice yell, if you sprinkle us zooks, you'll get sprinkled as well. Then itch had a sputter exactly like mine, and he yelled, my blue gooer works just fine. And I'm here to say that if yukes can goo zooks, you'd better forget it, because zooks can goo yukes. 
I flew right back home, and as you might have guessed, I was downright despondent, disturbed, and depressed. And I saw just as soon as I stepped back on land, so were all the girls of the Butter Up Band. The Chief Drum Majorette, Ms. Yuki and Sue, said that was a pretty sour flight that you flew, and the Chief Yukaru has been looking for you. All right, here comes the plot twist. My bright back, my... I raced to his office. The place was a sight. Have no fear, said the chief. Everything is all right. My bright back room boys have been brighter than bright. They thought up a gadget that's newer than new. It's filled with mysterious moo like a moo. And they can blow all those zooks clear to Salamagoo. They've invented the bitsy big boy, Boomeroo. You just run up to the wall like a nice little man. Drop this bomb on the zooks just as fast as you can. I have ordered all yooks to stay safe underground while the bitsy big boy, Boomeroo, is around. As I raced for that wall with the bomb in my hand, I noticed that every last yuke in our land was obeying our chief Yukaru's grim command. They were brave. They were all bravely marching with banners of flutter down a hole for their country in the right side up butter. That's when grandfather found me. He grabbed, he said, uh, you should be down that hole and you're up here instead, but perhaps this is all for the better. Somehow you'll see me make history right here and right now. Grandpa leapt up that wall with a lopless leap, and he cleared his horse throat with a bopulous beat. He screamed, here's the end of that terrible town full of zooks who eat bread with the butter side down. And at that very instance, we heard a clup clup of his feet on the wall, and an old Van Itch clupped up. The boys in his back room had made him one too. It was his fist was another big boy, Boomeroo. I'll blow you into pork and wee beans. I'll butter side up you to small smithereens. Grandpa, I shouted, be careful, OG. Who's going to drop it? Will you or will he be patient? Said Grandpa. We see. We will see. And that's the end. That's how it ends. That's it. So let's see if you guys figured out what the symbolism is of this book. Okay. So first off, um, you have butter. Yeah. So we'll talk about the ending, Dixia. Don't worry. Uh, wait. Don't say things yet. I'm not ready. Okay. So first thing, uh, you have. The butter side up and the butter side down. What is that in real life? What is the symbolism capitalism of that? Communism. Exactly. So capitalism, communism. Uh, anybody can tell. So the butter side up, these guys, which one are, is this guy? What country? U.S. Good. And this one's going to be communism because it's red. Okay. All right. So you've gotten to start. So that's good. That's good. So each of them are trying to make bigger and better weapons. What term is associated with that? The arms race. Good. Cheers. Arms race. Okay, good. So we have the arms race going on. Like, the Soviet Union is buttering their bread down, but in real life, they wouldn't have butter or bread. Well, yeah, I didn't think of that one, uh, but it is true. Okay, so you obviously have this weird wall right here. What's that wall? The Berlin Wall Iron Curtain. It's Berlin. the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, right? So you have the Berlin Wall. Notice that it said it started very small and then it increased. And then you do have that Iron Curtain. So on this side, you have butter side up. And on the other side, you have the butter side down. Really good, guys. Um, okay, so obviously you're having this arms race between the two, getting bigger and better and things like that between the two. What is the big boy Boomeroo? What weapon is that? The nukes. It is the nukes. So these are going to be the hydrogen bomb. Uh, is that why the red guys in video games are bad and the good guys are blue? The answer to that is yes. Um, that is something that's happened in the 1950s. You will notice a lot of color schemes. Um, you will also notice in, like, for example, John Wayne movies. If the John Wayne movie, if the guy has a black hat at the beginning of the movie, he's the bad guy. Um, that's something that continues throughout. So first off, butter side up versus butter side down. Is that really something that you should kill each other over? If, which side that you do that? No. No, nope. Jacob, the answer is no. Tracy, no. Kate, okay, guys, you're, the answer is no. Please don't kill people when they have butter up and down. Okay? So what is that saying, by the way, about this whole Cold War thing? Should we be trying to kill each other over, like, this kind of communism thing? It's trivial. So Ellie has it just right. So the idea is, is basically we have this trivial matter that they're willing to kill each other with. By the way, um, the Yukaroos, when they went, so this one, um, but I, one more. Okay. Uh, so, one, sorry, it's when we're streaming and my husband's playing video game streaming, it apparently slows down my computer. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Thank you. Uh, so, when they go underground, they're going into the bomb shelters and things like that. Um, the book ends, by the way, with it saying, like, we'll see, we will see. 
that's that um, mutually assured destruction. That's that brinkmanship. Is it basically just is there? And yes, you are correct. You can do rhyme with nuke. Hmm, that's weird. I wonder why that was. That's an Wait, odd. Rhymes with what? Yeah, uh, rhymes with nuke. Oh, interesting. Uh, does the new skyline have bomb shelters? The answer is no. The it's in fact, funny. the bomb shelters are supposed to be removed this summer. Well, that's disappointing. So, but we're all going to be fine because uh, we'll we'll be fine. We'll be fine, guys. It'll that's be fine. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so that's your little story time for the day, which brings us to our code, your access code for your quiz. So you need mm -hmm. to know that your access code for your quiz. Wait, where did my? Uh oh, we might have a problem. Uh, your access code for your quiz, if you want to go ahead and write it down, it is. It is butter. So butter is your access code. So if you want to go ahead and write that down, your access code is butter. Um, my PowerPoint disappeared. That's why I was concerned. It's not bus. Bus is for the one that's due today. The next one, though, is butter. Okay, chocolate is for the other one, too. Okay, so it might take a second because I don't know what the heck happened, but magically... All lowercase, right? Yes, all lowercase is butter. I don't know what happened, but my PowerPoint disappeared, so and I have to reopen it. Wait, so the one that's butter is locked right now. Yes, it won't be open until tomorrow. So the one for today is bus. Yes. Cool. That's correct. And for the FRQ today, the notes we did for last class, there is one we need for the one today, right? Yes. You guys are confusing me with your words. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Hey, why don't we just nuke coronavirus epicenters? That's not how that works. Okay. I'm sorry, this is taking so long. I don't know what happened. I totally disappeared. Okay, hold on. Uh, I want it to reopen. Okay, sorry guys. This is what happens when we try to do cool stuff. This means we can't do cool stuff anymore. Okay. Come on. Oh, I wonder if I can just open it this way. Hold on, talk amongst yourselves. Talk about butter, your lives. Butter side up, butter, butter side down. Butter. Communism Zooks. versus capitalism. Communism Ooh. versus capitalism. Please don't nuke each other. That's, I think that's one of the rules of the chat room is we're not supposed to say we're going to nuke each other. Nuking people is bad. Unless it's it's very bad. But again, you have to decide if it's necessary in some instances, such as Hiroshima. But and the nuking of Japan led to anime. Nukes led to anime. It is a fact. I can prove it. Okay. Well, maybe you can let me know that. I'm not sure. I've never heard that one before. So, okay. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, wait, no, I, cause I have a really cool thing I need to show you. Okay. Hold on. When I am talking to 90 people. Without the nukes, we wouldn't have cat girls. I've never heard of cat girls. You've never heard of cat girls? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I really, really, really want to show you something. Okay, this is what I'll do. So I'm going to talk to you about the next section as this loads. And then once it loads, then we will talk about this section. Maybe. Okay. Um, all right. So in terms of what you need to know for this Cold War, you need to know that brinkmanship thing. You need to know um, the mutually assured destruction and things like that and what would lead to um, us to come into conflict with each other. <sighs> This is frustrating. I apologize. This is so unprofessional. This is what happens when I try to read you guys stories. Somebody's coming in. Okay. Oh, I think we're almost there. We're almost there. My apologies, guys. I've got like 13 minutes to finish this up too. So I've got to hurry. Okay, here we are. All right, so I did want to show you guys something kind of interesting um, in terms of uh, something that I have to relate to today. Sorry, I was getting a little bit confused. Um, so 
basically with this whole nuclear thing, we do start to lessen down. So as you see the next part of your notes, I think talks about like the nuclear hotline and things like that. Um, so basically what we decided to do is we decided to create a new, um, a new direct contact with the USSR to kind of calm each other down a little bit. So that if we're ever in a situation where we get stressed out a whole bunch, um, our lecture is not done. I'm getting there. Don't worry. Uh, but yes, the red telephone, um, we created that with the USSR to kind of calm each other down a little bit and not get stressed out so much. Uh, but we also started to kind of calm things down a little bit too. So for example, we started to say that, um, we're not going to nuke each other unless it comes into, um, start part of the what show. I don't want to stop lecture now. I have something to say. Okay, there it goes. Okay, maybe this will work now. Okay, hey, we're back. Okay, cool. Sorry, that was five minutes of still loading. It stresses me out when things don't work the way I want it to. Oh, come on. Okay, sorry guys. I don't know how I exited out of the PowerPoint either. Okay, here we go. Um, so this is what I wanted to talk to you guys about to give you like a little fun little fact. So ever since that happened, um, basically we have this thing that's called the nuclear football. So what we agreed to do is we agreed to basically create this single case that would have all of our nuclear codes in it. And basically what happened is we took all of these nuclear codes and we put them in this case. And the goal of the case is that if anything were necessary, they could always at any time launch all of our nuclear weapons within less than 15 seconds. Um, and yes, it might be because Mark is playing video games. We can blame him because he's playing Call of Duty over there right now. Uh, but anyway, so this is what the nuclear football looks like. So it looks like a regular briefcase from the outside, but it's actually um, connected to an aid with something that's an unbreakable cord. Uh, the case itself is unbreakable as well, unless you have a special code to be able to get inside of it. Um, it's also is the name comes from this nuclear war plan that was called Dropkick. And so because of that, that's where you get this like name of the nuclear football. So why would you care about the nuclear football? And it's skipping ahead just a little bit, but that's okay. I'll just try to talk about it. Uh, so basically there's been several instances in time where the nuclear football codes were important. So originally, if you were the president, you had your nuclear football codes in the same exact location as your briefcase. Well, what happened is there were several incidents where this became a problem. So for example, in one incident, um, there was a president that was hanging out at his house in Texas and they had gotten a brand new car and a person got in the car and was practicing driving it, but didn't realize that the nuclear codes were in the car and he had the nuclear football. And basically what happened is, is that the person drove away and then the FBI chased them, did like a pit maneuver to crash the car to get back the nuclear codes. Um, this incident is the Ronald Reagan incident, which we just barely had the anniversary a few days ago. Ronald Reagan was shot in an assassination attempt. And then when he was brought to the hospital, um, he famously said to his doctors, I hope you're all a Republican. Well, what happened is, is that he kept the nuclear codes in his shoe. Well, what happened is when he went to the hospital, they separated his shoe. So his shoes were put in this little cubby for three days until somebody figured it out or somebody could have grabbed those nuclear codes and be able to launch all the nuclear weapons in the United States. Um, so because of that, they have a new rule. So basically, it's always separated. So the president at all times has nuclear codes. Somebody else carries a nuclear football, which has all the locations of all the nuclear missiles in the United States. Um, well, what's happened, though, is and my computer is going like super, super, super slow. Um, so basically what's happened though is that there's been several incidents in the past where this has become a major issue. Um, sorry, this is getting really slow. I might have to ask Mark to get off of his video games, although he's going to get really mad at me. Are you on Wi-Fi or Ethernet? No, I'm on Wi-Fi. Mark. Oh. Mark. Mark, I need you to get off. It's going too slow. I'm sorry, you can play in a minute. Uh, so anyways, basically what happened is, is that um, there's been several incidents in the past where there's been some issues. So for example, this guy was the guy that had the nuclear football for Donald Trump just a couple of years ago. And what happened is, is that he was at Mar-a-Lago in Florida and a guy found out he was the guy that holds the nuclear football. And because of that, um, they took a picture and he posted it on social media. 
And what ended up happening because of that is because he was on the social media, this guy ended up getting fired from being able to hold the nuclear football because now it was a, a, a international issue of whether or not he could have that or not. Um, this was an issue that happened a couple of years ago is basically they went to China and when they were in China, this is the guy that was holding the nuclear football, which is the same guy in the last picture. And what happened is while they were in China, um, basically they got separated. So the nuclear football must always been with a, be within 50 yards of the president. And what happened is he was stopped by Chinese security guards. And because that threatened national security, um, he ended up basically running up and tackling um, the uh, people in the Chinese government. And what that resulted in is it became a huge international conflict. He got arrested, but he was doing everything he could to be able to get within that 50 yards. That 50 yards, by the way, um, still is included today. So even though there's 50 yards, like, for example, when Trump is sleeping, somebody has to always be within 50 yards with the all the nuclear football and all of the locations of all the nuclear bombs. And so they actually have a secret room right next to um, – so they have a secret room right next to the President Trump's bedroom, as well as the Oval Office. The guy with the nuclear uh, codes always sits in, and he's always awake. So they have people that transition back and forth. And it's actually one of the um, biggest ones that, um, like, it's a really big honor to be able to do that as well. So, again, like I talked about before, they create the hotline. This is uh, what's called the red phone. We do have a direct heart, uh, phone line going to the USSR. And then also we had this idea of the peaceful coexistence this is the relaxing of tensions going on with uh, USSR saying that we can continue to compete, but not with their nuclear war power. So um, because of that little pause and things like that, um, we're not going to be able to do what I wanted to do. So everything that is above, so everything that's above this last one of peaceful coexistence, that's going to be eligible for the FRQ. And then I'll take this stuff and put it um, on the lecture in two class periods. Sound good? So we'll go ahead and we'll we'll stop there um, so that we can be able to, since that kind of put us behind, and I don't want to keep you guys for a super long period of time. Sound good? Yes. Okay. Uh, so things that could be on this uh, FRQ quiz is mostly going to be Cold War stuff, peaceful coexistence, um, coming together clashings, armed races, things like that um, different things. And then we'll talk about this in two class periods because we won't have time with the Vietnam lecture lesson. But my computer now is going like crazy, crazy slow.